Well, good morning, Bethlehem Baptist Church. It's good to be here once again with you. As we know, we're living in difficult times when it comes to what we're going to do with church and when we're going to meet again. But we're going to be doing everything we can to ensure that we can get together as soon as possible uh, to be able to serve you in every way that we possibly can. Well, this morning I'm talking about something that uh, might make you cringe a little bit as I pull my knife out here. But uh, today we're going to be looking at the, uh, the covenant of circumcision or at least what it is that the Apostle Paul said is now the new circumcision. Because when we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're talking about a blending together of an old covenant and a new covenant. Paul, of of course, was caught right in the middle of this, the hinge point between the old and the new. And people were asking him all sorts of questions. What should we do with the old covenant? Well, Paul uh, wants to cut away, if you like, a few um, bit of bad thinking a few strange ideas about what circumcision should be in this New Testament era. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at how it was that uh, Abraham, the father of their faith, the Jewish faith, was given instructions about circumcision as a sign of the covenant that he was made, made to have before God. So let's read from Genesis chapter 17, and uh, we'll pick up on this story. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old, The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make you make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Well, of course, uh, it's great to have a covenant, isn't it, between you and God. I'm sure Abraham wasn't that excited about the idea of circumcision. And so what we've got to do is just roll the clock back a little bit here and understand what circumcision is. For the Jewish male boy who was born at the age of eight days old, they were taken into the temple and there the foreskin was chopped away by the priest. And in doing so, this became a sign of a covenant, that they were part of a covenant people. Now, the most important thing to understand when we talk about circumcision is that circumcision isn't the covenant. This isn't about people being circumcised for the sake of proving that they are better off before God but rather this is a physical sign in the bodies of the Jewish men to say that they have been set apart, covenant before, covenanted before God. And uh, the interesting thing about this covenant is that it's something that was hidden because nakedness was frowned upon within the Jewish community. And yet there were other evidences that they were people set apart for God. The, the, the clothes that they wore, the haircuts that they had, the food that they ate, as well as having the Sabbath where they wouldn't do any work. And yet within the, uh, the frame of their clothes, within their, within their privacy, they knew also that they had been covenanted before God through circumcision. And so, as I say, circumcision was a sign of the covenant. It wasn't the covenant itself. And this is really important as we look forward to what it is that Paul's going to say to the Colossians. So let's have a look at what Paul's saying to the Colossians now in this context of transition from an old covenant to a new covenant. Paul is being very, very deliberate here, and he takes this covenant of circumcision, and he's going to apply it to our spiritual lives in a remarkably clever way, a very clever way. Paul said to the Colossians, In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him 
through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Well, those are enormous words once again as we're finding in this letter written to the Colossians. Uh, But let's just remind ourselves here that circumcision was done to baby boys, but now Paul is saying that spiritual circumcision applies to both men and women. And uh, for Paul, this idea of circumcision is not lost. It's not something that's separated out a part of an old, but it actually forms part of a new language that Paul is talking to us about in respect to the condition of the human heart. You see, Paul is saying that we no longer need to be physically circumcised as a sign that we are God's people, but rather baptism serves as a sign of Christ circumcising your heart. Now, baptism, we're going to have a look at this in a moment, a little bit more, but um, the circumcising of your heart is really where God wants the action to happen. Of course, there's no physical circumcising of your heart. It's a spiritual circumcision. It's a cutting away of that which symbolizes the life of the flesh, the life that is uh, singularly focused on our own selfish ambitions. And so therefore, Paul is saying to us that this baptism that you are called to participate in as a sign that you have transferred your life or your allegiance from uh, your own selfish ways to those of Christ, this serves as a circumcision. And so really what's happening is we're being told that when we are baptized into Christ, we get a circumcision of our heart happening for free. And the same thing applies here in many respects to what the old covenant was describing. You see, the old covenant circumcision was something that was hidden. Okay, it wasn't seen in public because men weren't naked in public. And in the same way, the circumcision of your heart is something that is hidden. It's deep within you. It's something that can't be seen except for the evidence that is the outward evidence of the fruit of the Spirit within your life. So you've got this inner and outer uh, context here that's being described by Paul in a way that allows us to see that God is interested in the things of the heart. Because the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is very much one that goes from the externals looking good and wanting to impress God in a way that uh, sees us being uh, tied down in legalism. But Paul is saying, no, no, this is about a circumcision of the heart. It's your heart that's been won and that has been captured by Christ. And furthermore, furthermore, as Paul is saying, he says that your baptism now raises you into new life that is resurrection life. And it's this resurrection life is where the power is, the power to live a life with a circumcised heart, the power to live a life with the things of the flesh no longer contending for our um, priorities, the things of the flesh no longer wrestling with us in respect to putting our own life first rather than the life of Christ first. Uh, During the week, I was looking up some different translations of this passage And uh, I came across the message translation, you know, the message translation done by Eugene Peterson. And I think he captures this part of this uh, text really, really well. So let's, let's read from the message translation, the verses that we've just read. Entering into this fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws. No, you're already in. Insiders not through some secret of initiation, right? But rather through what Christ has already gone through for you, destroying the power of sin. It's in an initiation rich if it's an initiation ritual you're after, you've already been through it by submitting to baptism. Going under the water was a burial of your old life. Coming up out of it was a resurrection, God raising you from the dead as he did Christ. Well, there, I think uh, Peterson has put it into a, into a really, really good form of words. What he's saying to us is that um, that's not a ritual that we're tied back to through some form of legalism. And yet, the funny thing about the human condition, the funny thing about us, is that we actually like rituals and we like secrets. 
Apostle Paul was, again, pushing back on the Gnosticism that was coming through. This idea that there was secret initiations going on. People were being told that if they did this or did that, they'd be given more information, more secrets, and that would create a superiority over other Christians. Paul wanted nothing of this because, as we've said in previous weeks, the gospel itself is public truth. There is nothing hidden, nothing undisclosed, no secrets that are in this uh, message of the gospel that are going to be discovered at some point once you qualify. And if anybody suggests to you otherwise, then they are an absolute uh, misrepresentation of the gospel of Jesus. The gospel is public truth, pure and simple. And yet, as I say, we like secrets. Some of the most powerful societies within the world, even operating today, are built around secrets, like the Freemason Society has been around with for over a thousand years. And it's a, it's a secret society that builds its community around what others don't know and what they do know. In the same way, um, there, are, there are secret uh, economic groups today or uh, different groups that work in secret to others. And all of these are very attractive. Uh, Paul also says to us that we shouldn't be over impressed with the rituals of these secrets or the rituals that surround religious service. You see, religion, uh, sorry, ritual is very, very attractive. Ritual is very, very powerful. In fact, ritual is high theater. And we go into some churches and we are struck by the grandeur and the high theater of what is going on as this message is delivered to us in a mystical way. And in itself, it doesn't look to be too, um, well, how should we say, troublesome. Uh, but it can be a, a method in which we get enamored by the ritual. And in itself, it doesn't actually do anything for you. You see, in ritual, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a circumcision of the heart going on. We're just super impressed with what we see, the smells and the bells and the artwork. God is saying that's all very well, but unless there's a circumcision of the heart happening at the same time, then that's of no value to me. So let's see what else Paul had to say here. Paul said this, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. So let's just take a look at that first few words there. Paul said, when you were dead in your sins. Now that in itself is a confrontation. That is shocking news for many people because we would like to think ourselves as being good, reasonable, solid citizens. And yet when we look at scripture and we compare ourselves to the person of Christ, we realize that our life is anything but perfect, anything but righteous, anything but good. Paul says, we were dead in our sins. And by being declared dead, it means that we have to be born again. We have to be raised to new life. And so what Paul is saying here is that we start from a position where Christ has to qualify us. You see, we're told in Romans that uh, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this is really important to understand what grace looks like. Grace says that whilst you had no means of saving yourself, you were given an opportunity to be saved, not because of your own good works, not because of ritual in your life, not because of secret understanding or information, not because of any uh, priority you think you've got over other people. Whilst you were dead in your sins, Christ died for us. He initiated the process. And this is why our salvation is purely about Jesus' grace and his mercy for us. And so Paul talks now about this, um, this understanding of, being, uh, of our debts being cancelled whilst we were dead in our sins. So let's have a look at what Paul says here. He says, Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So here Paul's talking about uh, our salvation in, in the sense, sense of, in a legal framework um, because he's talking here about our level of indebtedness, our legal indebtedness. Now in New Zealand, if you, um, if you run uh, into trouble financially and, uh, and somebody is 
wanting to pursue the debt that you owe them, uh, that person can go to a court and get a judgment made against you as a debtor. And then that is then taken to court and you have the right to defend it. But if you haven't paid your bill, there is no defense at all. And at that point, you're adjudicated bankrupt. What happens is the official assignee who acts on behalf of the government then takes possession of all your possessions and tries the best they can to distribute to your creditors anything by way of compensation for the debt that you owed them. And so it's a very, very mean process. It's a very hard process. It's a very legalistic process. And uh, it means that somebody will be in bankruptcy for up to seven years in New Zealand, sometimes even longer, depending on the nature of of the debt. Uh, Seven years before you can have uh, financial freedom to start again. And there's a sense in which what Paul is saying to us here about our legal debt, our legal indebtedness that we have before God, that falls in very much the same category as bankruptcy. You see, a bankrupt person has no ability to pay their own debts. No ability to pay their own debts. Their debts far outstrip their capacity, far outstrip their, their, their ability to pay it back. And so what we're being told here is that that legal debt, in as much as we owe God that legal debt, that debt has been taken away and it has been nailed to the cross. It has been nailed there just as surely as Christ was nailed on that cross. And so in every sense of the word, our sinfulness is nailed to the cross of Christ. When he died, our sins died with it. Our indebtedness was taken away. And this is a powerful, powerful statement because it tells us that it's all about Christ from beginning to end. When we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He took our indebtedness and he nailed that to the cross. And in doing so, he paid the price for our sin, our indebtedness. And even better, we're going to have a look in a few moments, but he he was raised to new life not only forgiving us our debt, but giving us over to a new life, the resurrection life. One of the more powerful stories that we find in Jesus' own life was a story that happened one early morning in Jerusalem. The scriptures tell us in John's gospel that that Jesus had spent the night praying in the Mount of Olives. And he came down into the marketplace and there he was teaching the people about the kingdom of God. But there was a noise in the crowd and people looked up and could see that some Pharisees and Sadducees had been dragging a woman towards Jesus. And as they dragged this woman towards her, they threw her in front of Jesus. And in doing so, they started to talk about what this woman was guilty of. Jesus, they say, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery and Moses' law commands us to stone this woman to death. Well, everybody knew it was a trap. What was Jesus going to say? Was he going to uh, push back against the law of Moses and then disqualify himself as somebody who was an upstanding Jewish man of theology and practice? Was he going to say, hey, let's stone this woman because she is guilty? So he was caught in a tension, in a dilemma. And the scripture tells us that these men kept badgering Jesus. What shall we do, Jesus? Well, Jesus' response was to crouch down in the dirt. And it said that he started to write in the dirt with his finger. Well, no one knows what he wrote that day. But he stood up and they kept on accusing Jesus and this woman. And then ultimately Jesus said, Those of you who are without sin, you can be the first ones to cast a stone at her. And then we're told that he crouched down again and started to write in the dust. Well, from Jesus' position, from Jesus' perspective, he would have seen what happened this way. He would have seen the feet of the older Pharisees and the older Sadducees, those religious leaders, He would have seen the feet of the oldest turn first, walking away, maybe leaving those rocks of judgment on the ground. And then after a period of time, 
everybody had walked away. Jesus looked to this woman and he said to her, Woman, where are those who condemn you? She said, there's, there's no one, sir. And he said, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. You see, in a sense, what Jesus has done is he's turned that knife of circumcision upon the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He's basically in that moment taken his knife, the knife of the spirit, the knife of his wisdom, and he started to cut away at the hard-heartedness of those men who were judging that woman. And we can only guess what it was that Jesus wrote in the sand that day. Maybe he wrote the names of some of these high priests and just happened to write a sin that they were guilty of, something he knew and only he knew because he was God. But it was enough to start cutting away at the hardness of their heart. And that's the nature of what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, as Christians, we should allow for the circumcision of the heart to continue. We should allow it to be something that we are defined by. And as much as our grace, our mercy, our, our love for others should be an acknowledgement that we were loved first, that we have been given favor by God, that our legal indebtedness caused us to be condemned. Paul said this, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. And therefore, with this legal charge now cancelled, we have been made completely new. We have been completely reconciled to God. But the cutting away is an ongoing process. And we're reminded that it's Christ who died for us. There is nothing more pure and nothing more simple. But Paul doesn't want to leave it here. Paul doesn't want to finish the story with the, the resurrection being the, the final word in this time. Because what Paul is wanting to say now is, is use something that is common within the frame of the Roman understanding of what victory actually looks like. And now Paul does something fascinating. He starts to talk about the powers and the principalities that have been defeated. And he uses terms that are very common to Rome because the Romans are always at battle and the Romans were returning as victors. And I want you to pick up on the language that Paul now uses when he says this. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, Paul is using language here of a victory procession. A victory procession would happen when the Romans came back from battle. And what they would do is the, the leaders would come in, always, if often, more often than not, on a white horse. And we pick up that in the book of Revelation where Jesus himself returns on a white horse in the end times. But the white horse was a symbol of victory, a symbol of purity and a symbol of power. And so the leaders would come into Rome and they would literally drag those who they have defeated in battle in behind them. And more often than not, these people who have been captured and been defeated were naked, held in chains and paraded in front of the people of Rome so that they could see how valiant their army was, how powerful their army was. And in doing so, they totally humiliate those whom they have defeated. And Paul uses this language, see it again. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So the only difference in this scene is the difference that Paul knows is where the final victory has been in the cross of Christ, defeating powers and principalities, the powers and principalities of sin that have held us captive. What I'd like us to do as we finish off our time this morning is to look at, uh, again, at Eugene Peterson's message translation. And there I want you to see what it is that we've just looked at in his words, because I think he captures for us again in real, uh, real layman's terms what it is that Christ has done for us. Paul says this in the message translation. When you are stuck 
in your old sin-dead life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it, all sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, the old arrest warrant cancelled and nailed to Christ's cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. Amen. I love that when he says, and he marched them naked through the streets. The victory that we have been given at the cross is complete. Sin has been completely defeated. Sin has been completely humiliated. And yet there is an ongoing responsibility for us as followers of Christ to ensure that we stay under the knife, to ensure that the things of the flesh don't grow back in the circumcision of our heart, to ensure that the circumcision of the Spirit continues in our life so that we can grow to a greater level of maturity in Christ. Repentance is a gift from God. Confession is the admission that we don't do it in our own strength. Confession is a way in which we bring ourselves back to the foot of the cross and remind that we will always be sinners in need of a Savior, but that the the knife will continue to do its work and cut away that which separates us from God. So now as we stop in this moment, I want us, to, uh, want us to pray. I've talked a lot today about the condition of the human heart. And uh, we don't want to have a life that's lived under the heavy yoke of sin. Maybe for some of you, um, what I've talked about today about baptism just challenges you to take that public step of baptism. Because it means for you that you're submitting yourself not only to the will of God, but the the circumcision of the, of, the, of the spirit, the circumcision of the heart that is an ongoing work in your life. So maybe today can be a day of new beginnings for you and a day to remind yourself that being under the knife is a way in which God brings healing. To be under the knife is a way in which God brings us closer to him. Let me pray. Father, as we have looked at the scripture today, we are reminded at some level the pain of what salvation brings, the pain of separating out the old flesh life from the new life in the spirit. And for us, Lord, that means repentance and it means allowing us to give permission to the surgery that goes on in our lives. And in doing so, God, we give permission to your your knife to cut away the things of the flesh within us. Lord, we... um, We're so grateful that you who uh, laid down your own life did this before we deserved any of your favor. You did this in a way that caught us and embraced us and poured mercy into us through the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection. So Lord, let us live as people perpetually open to that heart surgery of circumcision that we might triumph over sinfulness, that we might triumph over temptation, that we might triumph over the things that would lead us astray to be committed completely fully to you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.